Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for the webinar on finding teaching materials for fall 2020 and beyond, evaluating resilient digital teaching and learning materials from open and commercial sources for K-12 teaching. My name is Meredith Jacob and I'm the public lead for Creative Commons United States and a project director at the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University Washington College of Law. I work on public interest intellectual property there, specifically talking to teachers, professors, and librarians about copyright, fair use, and open education. I'll introduce our other panelists as we go through the webinar, and so you'll get to know them as we go. The point of this webinar is to evaluate what types of digital teaching and learning materials might be available to teachers in K-12 to adapt to both the emergency teaching happening right now and also to provide flexible materials that can be delivered in person but also digitally for disrupted teaching in fall 2020 and beyond. So we'll talk a little bit about the educational landscape for that and then talk about the copyright um, limitations on traditional materials and the flexibility allowed by open educational resources. We'll then go through and talk about how to build a team to evaluate and implement open educational resources, how to work with teachers to do curation and uh, build collaborative implementation projects. And then in the second half of the webinar, we'll talk about how to find open educational resources and some large publishers and resource creators that you can turn to. So thanks again for joining us. And first up, we'll hear from Christina Ishmael. Christina is the Senior Project Manager of the Teaching, Learning, and Tech team at the Education Policy Program at New America. Before joining New America, Christina was the K-12 Open Education Fellow at the Department of Education at the Office of Ed Tech. And before that, at the Nebraska Department of Education, where she led professional learning and advocated for school librarians. Christina, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, grateful to be here again in this series. And here we are. Um, if you are joining us, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. I know that it is hard to do that sometimes in the midst of a pandemic as well as trying to balance schedules and um, with children at home and trying to teach and all of the extra things. Uh, so let's look at where we are. Um, according to Education Week, which has been documenting uh, all of school closures and whether they are recommended or actually ordered by state uh, governments or whatever that may look like, uh, we currently know that 41 states, two US territories and the District of Columbia, which is where I currently reside, are all closed. Um, that is impacting 124,000 public and private schools across the country, as well as 55.1 million students. Um, that is a lot. That Those numbers are really, really significant. Um, we know that not every child is being reached right now. Um, our homeless population, our vulnerable students in general, um, for the, the children of frontline workers who are out, um, currently working may not be um, connected to a lot of our, our uh, schools right now. And so we're just kind of trying to do what we can do. And I really want to recognize the fact that we are doing the best that we can do right now. Um, so thank you again for all the work that you are doing. What does this look like moving forward? We don't really know, unfortunately, um, because none of us have ever been in something like this. But I think it's important to kind of address where we, uh, where we're talking about this right now as far as education policy is concerned um, in the greater context of the, the country. And so if we look at the next slide, looking forward, um, as of yesterday afternoon, uh, Ed Education Secretary DeVos announced the CARES Act for the K-12 emergency relief funding, where 13.5 billion is specifically designated for K-12 emergency relief funding. And there's one part in there in particular that I think is really important for us to note in the context of this conversation, which is, that they will call on states to develop plans that will only take about three days. They've said three day review, um, fingers crossed on that. I used to work there, fingers crossed on that. Um, calling on states to describe how states will support school districts in all of this. They wanna emphasize remote learning and they also talked about um, developing new informational and academic resources. 
So if we look at states that would be developing content, um, we would hope that we would be able to share that content across states and, and across districts. Uh, but that is up to each state, of course. And so um, it's really a time for us to, uh, this is actually in the next steps at the very end, but it's, in, it's time for us to get involved with this as far as what we can do at the, the district level, but then also within our state's plans, of course. Um, I like to actually think about rethinking what public education looks like right now. I know that I've also seen a lot of tweets saying we're in the throes of a pandemic. We're trying to do remote learning. We're trying to like just manage what we're doing right now. Um, so please don't tell us that we can rethink public education. And while I, I definitely hear that, um, I think it's also really important to know that the people are starting to make decisions. And it's really, really important that educators' voices are included in those decisions, which is why I do think it is time for us to really rethink public education. And if educator voices are not included in that, then they will simply be the policymakers that make the decisions that then impact us in the classroom. So it is important for us to think about this. Um, at New America and, and with other think tanks and, and folks that are looking at policy, um, we're looking at a variety of scenarios in, in what could be our reality in the fall. Uh, there is a tweet thread that I posted yesterday that someone aggregated all of um, the higher ed institutions and how they're going to handle summer and fall learning. And I imagine that we will start to see this for K-12 as well. Uh, so here are some of the scenarios that we have put out there. Um, traditional face-to-face -face learning, whether or not this can happen, we're not really sure right now. And um, that means that we go back to our brick and mortar schools and we take extra precautions. Six foot distancing in a classroom, if you have ever run in a classroom, is really difficult. So that may be possible, but we're not really sure. Um, then we have this idea of traditional face-to-face -face learning that would be staggered or with tracked schedules. So kids would come in on one week, just one group of students, and then they might come in, uh, another group might come in the next week, and staggering the actual total number of students in a building uh, Hawaii actually did this a number of years ago because they had too many students for the buildings that they had and they had different tracks. So some kids would come from eight to noon and that was their entire school schedule. Some would come from one to five. The results were really mixed. Um, my former school that I was in in Omaha, Nebraska had a combination of a year round uh, calendar as well as a traditional calendar in the same building. And I was the English language learner um, teacher and I served 85 kids on my caseload and that was kind of a nightmare if I'm really honest um, just because I would start work in July when the year-round kids would come back and try to support them as they started to acclimate back to school and then the kids would come in mid-August on the traditional calendar and so that that is a, a mix of reactions on how that can actually uh, work out. Then of course we have traditional face-to-face -face learning with um, more governments considering reopening that they could go back to school face to face uh, and then if they see a spike in things that they would quickly shutter again and then we would have to quickly pivot back to remote learning so it would be that flexibility as far as having the face-to-face -face classes but then going quickly online if we had to shut down schools again and then we have two other options which are blended learning and online learning and blended learning being something that we've actually been talking about for a number of years um, in higher education as well as K-12, but it is kind of that hybrid model where we have face-to-face uh, -face as well as online learning um, that ranges as far as how it is implemented and what it looks like in practice. Um, a school district of a, a friend of mine that they do this in the suburbs of Denver where they actually have a physical building. Uh, all the students are online, but then they come to the building twice a week and everything else is online. So that's an example of what that could look like. And then of course we have the online learning and that is doing what we're doing right now, but with a little more thought <laughs> and applying some of those universal design of learning principles and some of the online learning principles that we know from higher education that we could certainly implement in a K-12 setting um, and really thinking about robust interactive learning experiences and instead of just trying to digitize face-to-face -face and try to cram things in at the very end, which is kind of where we are right now. So those are not by any means definitive or exhaustive as far as the scenarios for moving forward, but these are certainly the scenarios that we're talking about a lot in the policy world and where we think that um, where we might go. So um, I will kick it back over to jump into the actual topic here. Thanks, Christina. Um, and so as Christina mentioned, we're really trying to think through what, um, 
what is out there if you have to transition out of a traditional classroom environment? And um, as a baseline, we have the um, commercial services that provide the in-class materials you're using now. On the next slide, what you'll see is sort of a framework of how to think through the copyright questions around taking materials that are in person and then thinking how they might work in a digital space. So as a default, most educational resources that you encounter in the classroom, but also most written work, most photographs that you see out in the world are automatically protected by copyright. So you don't need to do anything to get a copyright. Anything that you write down, pictures you take, illustrations, all of those things are protected by copyright by default, and they're protected for a long time. So most things created since about 1924, pictures, books, articles are gonna be protected by copyright, unless there is either an exception under the law, so things might be in the public domain because they were created by a government employee, or there might be permission in the law, a specific provision of the law that gives you the right to use it, like fair use or another exception to copyright. Um, we did a deep dive on that two weeks ago, and if you go to the page that's in the Q&A, um, and also that you got and you registered that uh, American University page, you can watch that webinar. But just as an overview, the default assumption is everything is protected by copyright, and automatically, unless there's some exception or a user's right to use it, or it's fallen into the public domain. And so, if you don't think it's in the public domain, it's a recent material, it's put out by um, someone other than the federal government, and you don't uh, think you have a fair use reason for using it or another exception in the law, then you need either a license or other permission. And that could come in the form of permission from the author, an institutional license that your school paid for, a purchase, or as we're going to talk about here, it could be a Creative Commons license, which is an open copyright license. So on the next slide, this is sort of a flowchart that talks you through this question. Is this thing protected by copyright law? Is it an article or a book or an illustration or a picture or a movie? And so the answer to that is yes. Um, it's protected by copyright law. It's not in the public domain. And I'm really talking about the thing, the written thing or the picture, not just its idea. Then the question is, do I have fair use or another copyright limitation that would let me use that? And that's a, a question that takes more time than we can cover here on this webinar. So I'd refer you to the one we did two weeks ago. Um, but then if you don't think you have a, a right to use it under copyright law, then you need some type of permission. And that could be a Creative Commons license, an institutional license or subscription, some sort of allowed free classroom use or individualized permission. And on the next slide, I'll talk a moment about the Creative Commons licenses. These are standard open copyright licenses. So that instead of being a one-to-one -one license where the author or the copyright owner or the publisher writes a license that gives you permission to do that, or a purchase license like you subscribed or you have an institutional subscription, Instead, this is in situations where the person who created the resource, the author said, I wanna share this resource with everybody in the world to use for free, as long as they follow the basic terms of the license. And the license terms usually include the requirement that you attribute back and the um, requirement that you, sorry, really just the requirement you attribute back. They can have additional ones, but that's the basic. And these open educational resources are things that are made free by design and that they are, you are given the copyright permissions to use them. So you can fully use them, you can redistribute them. And Will Cross is going to tell you a little bit more about that. Will is our partner in this project and he's the, um, Director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the NC State University Libraries. Will, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so, so I, Meredith, you said some of this right now, but I'll say it again, just because we really do want to have a shared vocabulary here. When we talk about an open educational resource, the educational resource piece might be obvious to all the educators in the room, um, but the open piece does have this sort of 
specific meaning to it and it's often embodied in that creative commons license but the idea is that an oer is something that's free to use and has the set of permissions attached to it that you can do some other things that we'll talk about more in a moment about so as a librarian library licensed resources are awesome use those they're great but they're not open educational resources stuff that i find online that's free uh, that's really cool that's not necessarily an open educational resource so those those definitely have their place in the pedagogy as well but we're focusing on the stuff that's free to use and that you can sort of do a set of special things with. And the next slide starts to spell out what some of those special things are. The way we talk about the permission or the sort of special things that OER lets you do is often framed around this idea of the five R's. You can do these five words that start with R to an open educational resource. You can retain the work, you can revise the work, all down that sort of bulleted list that I won't read out to you laboriously. But the idea is you have the permission to do those different things and there are sets of pedagogical practices and things that you can do that are enabled in each case. So the ability to retain a work beyond the end of the semester is important because uh, our, our, link, our course lengths are in really weird places right now. So if you license something for from January until June and suddenly you're trying to teach into July, a licensed resource starts to become a problem, right? If a student wants to retain something for lifelong learning, because I'm gonna learn about this thing now and next year I'm gonna refer to it again and then 10 years later I'm gonna go back to it as well, that retention is really important. Um, the revision, right, is maybe equally or more important in a lot of ways. Um, an open educational resource can be revised so you can update it, right? I, I like this textbook, but this part is a little out of date. I can revise it and make it different in that way. Um, and just as much it can be localized as well. So if you open up a textbook and you see a, a sea of smiling, all white faces looking back at you, and all of your students aren't necessarily white people, you can say, I can replace some of the images in a way that reflects the, the students who are trying to learn in my classroom, right? You can make it better in that way or in a ton of other ways as well. Um, Remix, likewise, gives you the ability to combine resources. I really like chapter one from here and chapter four from here, and I'm gonna put them together in different ways, or I like this resource, but the sequencing doesn't work very well, so I'm gonna change it around in different ways. Um, reuse, so all of your learners can benefit from the power of OER, and then redistribution, so that you can connect your work in education to a broader community and share it out sort of into the wider world as well. So that, that set of 5R permissions sort of defines a lot of the, the value, the power, and the pedagogy around open educational resources. And on the next slide, we'll talk a little about what that looks like in practice. Um, so we always already talked about the idea of localizing in terms of replacing uh, sort of samey images with diverse faces, but there are tons of other examples as well. Um, our friends at eCampus Ontario have a process that they call Canadaizing textbooks, um, where they'll, they'll get like an American business textbook that talks about how to do business in the US, and the word dollars shows up a lot, and it talks about US regulations and that kind of thing. Um, and they, so they say, I like a lot of what's here, but it needs to be Canadaized. So you could Canadaize that thing. Uh, in my state, we North Carolina eyes things sometimes. So making it relevant to your learning community, whatever that learning community is, is a really important part of that piece. Accessibility, also something that's, that's really critical every day, but we're maybe thinking about even more in this moment as we're, we're making um, more, better, newer accommodations for our students. Um, if you've heard us talk in the past, you've heard us say that fair use gives you a lot of space in the copyright context to make works accessible. But when you're dealing with licensed materials where there are terms of use attached, and when you're learning with materials where there are technical limitations, that can become a fairly burdensome process. So the ability of OER to be quickly, easily made accessible, I think is really, really critical, as I say, in this moment and every moment as well. Another real advantage to open and open educational resources is there's a strong protection uh, around privacy for students and institutions as a whole. Um, we're in this sort of weird historical moment where surveillance capitalism is a thing, where the, the, the exchange we're often asked to make is we're going to sell our privacy or the privacy of our students in exchange for this ostensibly free service. Um, there might be legal, legal issues with that. There are definitely ethical and practitioner issues with that. So the ability to say, my student is more than a monetizable piece of content, my student is a, is a learner, uh, I think is tremendously important in this space. 
sort of related to that idea of being forced into a platform, one of the great things about open educational resources is they keep you from being locked into a particular publisher, a particular platform, or a particular provider as well. There are some services, and I'll let other folks decide if we're gonna name names or not, um, but there are, there are some offers going out right now that look too good to be true because they are. Right, they sign up now and it's gonna be free until June. And what they don't tell you is in June, you're gonna be locked into a two year contract and they're gonna charge you a per kid per year for a multi-year contract, et cetera, right? So, so it's the just sign on the dotted line question. OER doesn't have any of that. You can, you can use it now and you can use it forever and that Creative Commons license is the only term of use that it comes with. Sort of related to that idea, Open educational resources, because they're open, are easy to fit into your learning management system, which is important. Um, and a lot of the OER that we talk about have specific, specific cartridges that are meant to fit into a lot of those existing systems. Just as much, though, an OER doesn't have to have a learning management system. If where you are now is my pedagogy happens on YouTube, good news, it fits on YouTube just as well. If where you are is I've set up a personal website and it's going to go there, it fits in there as well. There, it, it is platform agnostic and reconfigurable to make sure it fits everywhere. And that's a really important affordance of that open license. Another tremendously important affordance right now is an open educational resource can be digital, but it doesn't have to be, right? There, there is no requirement that you be using a particular platform and there's no requirement that you be signed onto a particular platform as well. That if you're in a place where your students are trying to use their phones, an OER can be converted into that space. If you're in a place where your students need to download everything so they don't have to be online, it can be downloaded as well. The open license means that whatever approach makes the most sense for your students is available and lawful under the license. And then finally, sort of the last piece I wanted to talk about here is choosing an open educational resource is important for all the reasons that we've discussed, the sort of practical, technical, legal reasons but the choice to use an open resource and to really engage with it, to customize it, to tailor it, to make it more equitable, carries a message in and of itself. It says to students, I see you and I value you. I'm trying to bring my authentic self into this experience and I'm inviting you to bring your authentic self into that experience. And so we're not gonna use a one size fits all. We're not gonna use a sort of top down. We're gonna come together and use an open resource that gives us both agency and a voice in that process. And I think that's tremendously important as, as an action and as a gesture, as a signal to students that you really are engaged in this in a way that sees and values their expertise and their lived experience. On the next slide, the other sort of piece I wanted to say about the value of openness, I think flows directly from what we just talked about in terms of authenticity. Um, for me, the best part of being involved in open education isn't the resources, it's the community. It's the sense that you're working with folks who often share your values and are working towards a common goal. There isn't a quarter over quarter sort of fiduciary duty to see a return to shareholders. There is an obligation, there's a desire to make teaching materials that, that have these shared values of respect and reciprocity and that kind of thing. Um, this is a resource called the Five Rs of Open Pedagogy that's, that's framed around sort of the practices enabled by an open license, but I use it as a stand-in for a larger sense of using OER is also an invitation to join a community. Uh, and when I joined this community almost a decade ago, one of the first things I found was people wanted me to succeed. People wanted to share resources. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. And 10 other institutions said, hi, I saw you using this. <laughs> this supplemental material might be really helpful. Or we used it in this way. Try this thing as well. So OER is a, is a really good set of tools, but it's also a great community to connect with. And on that note, I'm gonna turn it on over to talk about sort of the next piece of open education and open educational resources. Thanks, Will. Um, and so Will, I think, has given us a great overview of both some of the technical differences between open educational resources and traditional commercial ones, and also okay. some of, I think, the uh, community differences. And Christina, I think in K through 12, um, maybe even more than higher ed, being able to tailor your materials to where your students are and to be flexible in the um, pedagogical approach is really important. Can you tell us a little bit about how OER enables that? Yeah, so I'll start with just uh, personal kind of anecdotes from when I was in the classroom. I'm a former early childhood and elementary teacher and the majority of my students were English learners in Omaha, Nebraska. 
Um, I know not everyone thinks that there are a lot of English learners in Omaha, but guess what? My first school district recognized 114 languages and um, that, that's quite significant. So the district issued curriculum was never sufficient. And like most teachers, I spent a lot of time uh, searching for resources for my English learners um, to scaffold their, their English language acquisition, but also just to provide additional support in different ways of presenting materials. Little did I know that at the time, um, copyrighted materials, whenever I would customize or localize, that wasn't necessarily okay. <laughs> um, for, for fair use and applying fair use to that, I may look at that a little differently now, but um, when I would find things that had a Creative Commons license on it, I knew that I had the permission to do it. And so I did. And a lot of times uh, we would, as a, as a class, we would go out and take photos of our community and start to incorporate that into the materials, or I would do that on my own. Um, because if you have ever worked with young children through the age of eight, they are very egocentric and only see themselves. And so we also had a lot of students that would never leave the community for personal reasons, for like, you know, like familial reasons, like they just didn't have cars or whatever it may be. Um, that was their world. And so whenever we could show that in the materials themselves or a little bit further outside of that, showing Omaha as a larger city, um, then that certainly helped. And so that is one way that we would customize or localize the, the content. And I know that there are a lot of other examples of how that might work in K-12, whether that's changing names of things to um, include student names. Again, what Will brought up around the inclusion and representation really, really matters like so, so much um, to let students know that they are seen and they are heard because we know that the majority of our instructional materials are still written from a very singular perspective and our students are not represented. Um, the majority of our students in the 52 point whatever million students, um, the majority is actually students of color and we don't see that reflected in instructional materials. So when we use something that has a license on it that affords us the ability to customize um, that certainly helps. Then you think about the flexibility as far as the, the actual instructional practices in the classroom. You can um, you know, incorporate a variety of materials to provide small group instruction and remediation or additional supports for students that might need that extra time and scaffolding um, because you can pull those resources pretty easily um, and then be able to customize it for their needs. And then whenever we're gonna hear from um, some folks that are actually doing this work within districts, but I think that you'll hear something that I hear often, which is the sense of ownership in all of this work, which is you have a team of folks that are like in the throes of searching for these materials, evaluating these materials, owning the standards, owning um, just kind of that, that ownership of creating, not just being handed the curriculum, like I mentioned, um, but that, they have created it themselves and then there's just this respect that is also then afforded to the folks that that did that by other colleagues they're saying my friend down the hall helped create this therefore i trust them i know that this is going to be applicable and and really helpful in my classroom and so there's this the sense of ownership that um i have not seen in other practices and where i've Seen, like veteran teachers legitimately 30 year veteran teachers are like I'm not leaving now like this is great I have this renewed sense of purpose and love of teaching and I want to continue this and so I have all these stories in my head and I try to share these as much as possible but I'm excited that we get to hear from other folks to hear the stories as well great thank you so much yeah uh, next up we have uh, Dan McDowell who's the director of the learning and innovation program at the Grossmont Union High School, where he's been the go open lead there since the national initiative launched in 2015. And Dan's going to talk about how, um, if you think that OER might be a solution for you, some ways that uh, your district could build a team to evaluate, vet, and implement OER. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, thanks for thanks for having me. So, uh, you know, in the Grossmont Union High School District, we're right outside San Diego. Uh, we um, five years ago started uh, rethinking how we wanted to uh, uh, obtain new curriculum. We were going one-to-one, -one, uh, every kid having a Chromebook and it seemed silly uh, and, and not productive, maybe silly is the wrong word, but and now I'll go with silly, to have all our content stuck in textbooks while we were trying to uh, kind of move into this digital world. while also trying to sort of rethink maybe our approach to instruction. We're, we're a high school only district. I know that's, that's really strange if you're not in California. 
Uh, but uh, in that, uh, we have a lot of traditional teaching practices that, that go back to the beginning of, of the, high school, the high school model. You wanna move on to the next slide? So, so as far as you know, how this happens, it, you know, I, I as a district administrator at the time, uh, and still I was the ed tech administrator uh, when, when we started this, uh, you know, had this idea, but really it only took off because there were teachers who also believed in this. It, it's really teacher driven and, and our, our sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tagline is, is teacher driven, district supported. So uh, while uh, I at the district level and, and our principals, uh, you know, and our superintendents and, and assistant superintendent uh, over the years have, have been all in on this, supporting the work. It's really the teachers who decided to do the work and then you know helped shape what the work looked like and then have, have run with it for the last uh the last four years and and we uh we've done some pretty deep work on a number of subjects all of our science so as ngss uh has kind of come into into uh the, the nation and in california we we instead of buying a ngss textbook that just really had a sticker on the front of it because you know, maybe they're coming out now. We we created our own set of resources, uh, and and these groups of teachers by subject area. We have ten high schools in the district. We have uh, represent representatives from most of the schools uh, come together, and they curate existing existing resources out there. So they are not writing a textbook. That was an initial fear everybody had. Oh, our teachers can't write textbooks. Well, we're not asking them to write a textbook. We're asking them to curate materials, maybe take some textbook-like like, uh, content and adapt it for their students or edit it down because it's too long or you know, maybe move things around to the order that makes sense to uh, what we're trying to do at, at our schools and in our district. Uh, and also make sure everything is vetted. Uh, and, and, and this wasn't just, uh, you know, anybody at 11 o'clock at night can do a Google search on any topic and find a million lesson plans and resources, but we all know that's not necessarily the best time or place to, to find resources. And I can remember when I was in the classroom, uh, same thing. I need something on this topic. I'll do a search. I'll do, I'll do an informal vetting of it from, from my view. Uh, you know, I know once the URL starts looking funky, probably, you know, uh, it wasn't quite, you know, wasn't quite uh, uh, as as appropriate as, as other things, uh, and so we have we've uh, we've created rubrics based upon the achieve rubrics that everything that makes it into our collections are are uh, are are vetted by our teachers based upon based upon the rubric, and and really we have three types of materials. We have our core content. California you have to have a textbook related to you know connected to every. Uh, you know, every course as, as your, your, your primary content. And kids have to have access to that. So even on Chromebooks, we have to make sure they can download that uh, onto their Chromebooks and make sure they have that material available to them, whether they're in the classroom or at home. And then we have all the supplemental resources. And so this is, this is everything from YouTube videos to, um, you know, to articles, to online simulations. Uh, and, and when we talk about licenses, the, our core content always holds an open, an open license. Uh, our supplemental resources may not have an open license, but they're free to access. And, and that's when we link, link to things. And so we look at sort of, uh, you know, we put an open license on the collection as a whole, which has, uh, you know, really these vetted resources in it. Although not every resource like a YouTube video from the History Channel necessarily has a has an has an open license so it's kind of a blend of of what's out there and you know for for anybody to access for free uh and also what's um you know you know what things that we are in our individual teachers can can then go and modify and as a district we can go and modify and, and then i think the next level is is those instructional materials that use those items so it's one thing to have access to a free textbook it's another thing to teach better and teach well with that free, to, you know, open license or, or any YouTube video. And so we've really spent a lot of time rethinking our instructional practices as part of our one-to-one -one program and also as part of uh, the deep dives that our OER teams have been, have been doing over the last few years. Uh, everything from 5e lesson, lesson plans, HyperDoc style, uh, you know, lessons that are out there, and also making sure that we're addressing the needs of all our learners. Uh, and especially our, our EL students, our special education students, or any struggling learner. Uh, some of the content out there is super dense, and we want to make sure that's, uh, that uh, we're providing 
access to that and we're delivering it in an engaging way. We're creating relevance and interesting, uh, real world, authentic, all the buzzwords, you know, I can throw in there task, but you know, they're buzzwords for a reason. They're, they, we want kids engaged. Um, and, and this has really helped us rethink a lot of instructional practice practices and, and modernize our practices as well. And, and as we turn the corner in the last week to go from, you know, we closed March 13th, March 13th, like a lot of schools in California and across the country. Uh, and then we had two weeks of sort of figuring some things out. Then we had spring break. Uh, last week, we, uh, we did a lot of professional learning. Um, and then this week, we, we, we started running. Uh, with with what we're what we're doing with our distance learning, but I've heard so much positive uh, feedback from teachers across my district in who are in OER teams and not in OER teams, uh, who who you know because we've already been having these conversations for years, the switch isn't as radical and and revolutionary and and you know uh, as as it might be might be in others. And our OER teams are even more set up right now because. Uh, they have all their curriculum online already and and they didn't always deliver everything through the screen You know, they printed things out and you know, it wasn't just just like, you know, do it online But now it's all online and uh, and you know, we, we just started English uh, in the fall and I, I've gotten some emails from our OER teams uh, You know saying hey, we want to continue this work because we this is we already if we had been a year ahead our English, te our English teachers would be set as far as the resources that they, they needed and had. And, and, uh, and, and we're going to uh, uh, restart. I initially didn't know if we'd just come back in the fall and start that work, but we'll restart our, our teams uh, in the next couple of weeks once distance learning is, is uh, uh, we're feeling a little more comfortable with, with what that's going, how that's going. But, but it's all you know, creating that mindset of, of, uh, of looking what's out there a little bit differently really thinking about licensing and materials and realizing that 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 book and making photocopies that you have or or that novel that you're stuck on uh, you know we don't always have access to those those resources so so that's the big thing and, and on the next slide just a, a quick overview of here's here's one of our biology uh, units and at the top you have the the lesson samples that these teams have come together and i and i I sit in, I don't attend all the meetings, but I try to attend them semi-regularly uh, and just sit in the room and listen to teachers who all teach the same thing, geek out about what they're passionate about. And that passion is two things. It's one, the content. And sometimes they start talking, especially I'm a social science, I have social science background. Once they start talking about some of the stuff, I don't necessarily know what they're saying. You know, my last biology class was in 10th grade, which was a very long time ago. Uh, and, but, but having them sort of geek out on that and then start talking about, well, how can we get kids, pull kids into this to make it so they want to learn this. And so that the big ideas of, of thinking about, uh, phenomena and thinking about science, uh, you know, how that, you know, how they can get, elicit that from kids. And, and so that's been super exciting to, to watch. And, and again, I'm the, I'm the administrator sort of overseeing the whole program, but it's the teachers who are driving the work uh, and, and their passion and, and their, uh, their enthusiasm for, for uh, the project uh, is, is great. And we're, we're four years in and this is, this is uh, you know, this is never, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's never gonna stop because we're always gonna be looking at new resources, new ways to look at teaching uh, the content. Science in particular is gonna change uh, and evolve. And then we wanna make sure that we are, uh, um, keeping on top of uh, our, our practices and, and making sure we're, we're reaching reaching all students. So, so that's sort of, you know, how it how it's looked in the Grossmont Union High School District. We have a, a great website that uh, my team uh, has has maintained oer.guhsd.net. I don't know if that could be thrown somewhere uh, in as a resource that has all the work that we've done except for English because it's still in its infancy. Uh, but we'll we'll be creating our English presence probably probably by the end of this uh, this semester since that group has uh, has uh, expressed interest in continuing continuing on. We had two more meetings that that were canceled, uh, and and we're really lucky to have some some great great minds working on that project as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, I know you can't stay with us till the very end, so I just wanted to ask you one of the questions that had come up about this. You know, you talk about how you're 
teams um, do the vetting for this? Because I think there's this image of teachers, like you say, Googling and just trying to evaluate materials on their own. But it sounds like, you know, to, to answer the question of how do you know if you're getting something high quality, that's a, a process that comes out of the groups. Can you tell us about what structure or training or how those groups work to sort of vet materials? Yep, yep. So, so we, uh, there's a, a series of OER rubrics uh, put out by Achieve, I believe is the organization. Uh, and and we took those and and they're great, but they're they're a little cumbersome to go through lots of uh, um, lots of resources. So we took those and and modified them, uh, and and then our science teams actually actually created a science version. We have a general version and then a science version. Actually, we'll probably end up with an English version as well. Uh, and and then you know what we do is is uh, uh, during the vetting process, they the teams come together and they calibrate. So they um, they they take a couple resources, you know. The, 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 you know, the, one of the calibrations that, that I got to sit on in on was uh, a video showing natural disasters. You know, which which and, and there there were actually not there were ten videos about natural disasters that all the you know every teacher had their own video about natural disasters, and so they they went through and watched all ten, and and then went through the the vetting process and was able to sort of narrow it down to the, the two best that then are in the, one of the, the Space and Earth uh, 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 curriculum collections uh, units. And, and so when they, they looked at the, you know, as far as accessibility for, for the different, different levels of kids and uh, the, the depth of the content, uh, you, know, you know, the length even, uh, and, and so they were able to kind of narrow it down and instead of putting uh, another gigantic list of 10 uh, videos about natural disasters, they got it, they have two that yeah. they say these are the, these are the best, the highest quality resources that we have. And so it's easier than for a teacher to like, I, instead of watching 10, here's, here are the two that uh, the teachers agree upon. Thanks. So, and thanks yep. so much for joining us, Dan. Um, and it was great to get the perspective on what's happening at Grossmont. All right, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, next up, we have Molly Yull, who is a digital learning grant coordinator and an English teacher at Danville, in Danville, Indiana. She also works with the State Educational Technology Directors Association, CETA, on open education projects. Molly, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, well, I was asked to share a little bit about the collaboration that we've had with some outside organizations in Indiana and then um, a program that we started called the Rockstars of uh, Creation. Uh, so think back about 10 plus years ago, um, Indiana created this level of grants at the state level um, to support districts who were looking to go one to one. Um, we had grants for those who needed um, to just evaluate um what they had in place those who had started to go one-to-one -one but wanted to expand and then those who were already one-to-one -one but really wanted to get um to that innovative level um and start replacing textbooks fully and uh, moving to digital resources um we then had a um, a program where we had pockets of districts who were doing these e-learning days um, to replace snow days um, and then that kind of grew and so um, really Indiana I feel like as a as an overall state has been in a fairly good place um, throughout this this um, pandemic um, so I'm really proud of the work that started happening you know a decade um, or more ago uh, but in 2013 we took some of these grant funds and these districts that were already one-to-one -one and really innovative and we started focusing on digital content curation um, and how we can kind of pull these rock star teachers from across the state together and, and put them in a room and let them work and give them time and so we created that in 2013. Um, we started just focusing, Indiana had moved from Common Core and we had these new Indiana acad academic standards. So we focused on math, ELA, science, and social studies at first. Um, and then after a couple of years, we expanded K to 12 with all content areas, basically anyone and everyone who was a rock star and willing to come and participate and share, um, we welcomed and, um, and 2000, I want to say February of 2016, Indiana became a go open state and kind of joined the national movement um, with the Office of EdTech and the other 
I think 13 states who had joined in at that time. Um, and so we took this cohort of teachers that we had from across the state and we, we switched our focus from just kind of curating all digital content to really focusing on OER uh, because we saw the value in um, what OER has to offer, but also what um, Will had mentioned, I believe, was the community um, of the OER folks and, and kind of um, the benefits of, of being part of that group. Um, and so we had this group of teachers together um, and there were definitely pockets. Um, their district had gone to one-to-one -to -one, and they weren't adopting new textbook be textbooks because those funds were being used to potentially pay for devices. And teachers were kind of left in this kind of in-between space where um, they were doing kind of continued use of old textbooks, but their students had these devices um, their district had maybe done pockets of professional development around how to best create and curate digital resources, but um, there was a lot of kind of gray areas in between. And so we wanted to create these models of uh, quality OER and these models of rock star teachers that could go across the state and even go, uh, you know, across the country and go present at OER conferences and go um, meet with CETA and present with folks there and uh, do webinars. Um, and so our focus was, was a handful of things, I guess, with this group. We wanted to ensure quality, which Dan had just talked about. And so we spent a lot of time talking about the vetting process. Um, and how do you ensure quality? Looking specifically at copyright, looking at fair use, um, looking at pedagogy, right? Um, DOK, looking at um, accessibility um, with our students because we, we noticed especially that accessibility piece was missing um, in a lot of districts when they were doing professional development for teachers around digital content creation and curation, they were really missing that piece. Um, and so that's where partnerships with CETA came in play and was really beneficial in having that network, the National AIM Center, right, the, the CAS group, that was really important for us and we benefited um, from that knowledge and we would offer professional development to our rock stars teacher, rock star teachers from groups like CETA, from groups like, you know, the National AIM Center. Um, and the goal was to really equip this group of rock stars um, to serve as models and then to go back out to their districts and share what they've learned. You know, it's, it's pretty hard for, um, a, a state team um, with a limited team members and of course limited resources um, to offer um, this really focused quality PD to, to every teacher in the state. But if we could do it, groups of it from across the state and then send them back to their districts, they could share their knowledge. And so, you know, think of the think pair share um, uh, process. Um, so we provided that proper PD, um, virtual, um, face-to-face -face, we would meet throughout the school year as well um, we also didn't want our teachers in Indiana that were already doing great things we didn't want them working in silos and so you know continuing to encourage them to to share and to almost divide and conquer the work so we would have like a pocket of say high school English teachers and we would encourage them to come together um, they would all have you know similar training um, and then they, they could really focus on, you know, what they were teaching um, throughout the school year. And it was really fun to see some teachers were really passionate about this, while other teachers were passionate about this. And they would bring those passions together and they'd say, oh, I have a really great unit on this. Let's work on, um, you know, how we can pull some OER with that. And um, let's work on a hyperdoc together, for instance, and um, they would share resources in that regard. And then, of course, those would go back out to their districts um, and their district libraries would grow. So it was kind of neat. Um, we definitely did not want our teachers in Indiana to feel like they had to completely reinvent the wheel, which I think is, you know, one of the benefits to OER is that sharing part. Um, also, um, you know, we looked at sharing all this work as models. And so initially we were sharing, you know, honestly, like on a Google spreadsheet. And then um, we um, had adopted kind of loosely like a state LMS and we were sharing through that. Um, and more recently we were looking at, you know, having a hub on OER Commons. And so that's kind of, I think, kind of put on the back burner for now as, as things have taken place. and and roles have shifted but um you know having the opportunity for these teachers to really highlight their work and share as models um and then 
another benefit of having these rock star teachers was not only being able to pull them together, allow these high flyers and like teacher leaders to be able to get proper professional development, to work together, um, to have time out of their classrooms to create and share. Um, we also were able to send them out. Um, we would provide subs for them and we could send them out and they actually um, per, had workshops that they did throughout the state. So we would hit all corners and areas of the state um, one or two times throughout the school year. And they would do like a full day intense workshop on the basics of, you know, digital content curation. And they would focus on OER and they would talk about accessibility and copyright and kind of like the need to knows to get started. Um, and then they became a resource for the folks that attended. Um, we also had a strand of summer bee learning conferences in Indiana. So every summer we have 17 to 23 conferences um, that we partner with districts and give them some money and they host um, conferences for folks in kind of their area. And so our rock star teachers would go and present there as well. And they talk about OER and accessibility and copyright. Um, and share the work. So it was just a, a great way to kind of take our teacher leaders and build them up. Um, we really, in Indiana, we love to celebrate teachers and all the great work that they do and um, help out as much as possible to kind of elevate them and bring a lot of um, just respect to the profession. So um, the neat thing about this is, um, although this was done at the state level, I think it can definitely be replicated. Um, kind of like Dan had mentioned at the district level, um, you know, you can easily, not easily, I guess, but with, with some effort, right? You can definitely build a similar network within your building or within your district. Um, you know, encourage a, a digital repository or an OER library. Um, if your district doesn't have one, you know, uh, maybe you, maybe you go to um, Teachers Give Teachers and you um, you know, start with HyperDocs and you guys build your own little library that you can share. And maybe it is just a spreadsheet, you know, among, um, among your teacher group uh, or among your district. Um, you know, look to places that are already created like OER Commons. We're going to hear from them later on. Um, but more than anything, I think the importance of creating these little rock star hubs is um, encouraging and modeling responsible use um, for yourself, for your peers, and more importantly, for your students. Um, so one of the things I love um, about kind of helping build up these teacher leaders um, is sharing the message to our colleagues who we don't always have buy-in from is the fact that we need to be educated um, around these areas of, uh, you know, what's, what's paid, what's free, and what's open um, because we need to be models for our students um, and what's appropriate use for them and what they can and cannot do with content that they find on the internet. Um, and so that's, um, that's something that I always try to share is that, you know, we're responsible for being responsible users to our students. Um, make, a, make a pledge. Um, th this is all very overwhelming for some people, especially that have kind of been thrusted into this digital environment and who are kind of floundering to find quality content. And I, I get it. It's so much easier just to go online and do a Google search and grab something um, and assume that it's free and you can do what you want with it, right? Um, and so just taking small steps. So maybe you're first going to focus on the images that you use and you're going to make sure that the images that you use are open and you're going to go to the proper places to go to find free open stock photos, right? Um, but just make a pledge to yourself that moving forward, you're going to start to educate yourself, um, you know, on responsible use on paid versus free versus open, um, and everything you create from this point forward, right? You're going to you're going to do responsibly um, and within the law um, and then allow your students to kind of take that take on that role as well start teaching them um, you know what's appropriate to use and what's not and what's free and open and allow them to kind of take some of that creation and curation component off your hands because kids um, are great at finding content and making it as well um, and organizing it for themselves so um, definitely perks to being able to personalize oer and kids appreciate that so Thanks. Yeah. That's a really great perspective, I think, on the, um, I think, as you said, figuring out a way to support teachers who are already the leaders in their teacher communities and to use them as sort of the nucleus of these creation efforts. Um, yes. To talk a little bit more about um, some teacher collaboration models and about how to evaluate materials, to vet them, and to make sure that they're um, 
aligned with the rest of your curriculum goals, we have Joanna Schmitty, who is a professional learning specialist at the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education, which is ISCME, and she's a biology teacher at the North Carolina Virtual Public School. Joanna, thanks so much for joining us and for telling us about the work you're doing to vet and create OER. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so on the next slide, I've kind of offered a few things as we think about um, what teachers are doing with materials, because as Molly and Dan have said, a lot of times you and your team are searching for materials. Um, and so I I actually have this um, this linked in the slides, the Achieve OER rubric, and I'll put it um, in the chat box as well, um, the link to it in case those of you on there want to click off uh, later, um, but when you get access to the slides. Um, this is one of the things that we've seen teachers really, really need, but that they also really, really like having. They like having some examples of how do I know if this is high quality? And someone had asked that in the chat box, um, the question answer box as well. And so um, Achieve is who uh, created the Equip rubric, if you're familiar with it, but they have an OER specific rubric. So I grabbed a screenshot of the um, different kind of sub rubric. Uh, I would kind of normally call them indicators, but they've identified them as kind of um, eight different rubrics. Uh, and the great thing about that is they can kind of stand alone. So what we see that teachers want to do is if you offer them an eight <laughs> indicator rubric, it's super overwhelming. So with our teachers, we usually really filter it down just like you would for your students. And we choose um, one or two indicators that as a group we're going to look at. And then we let them have some individual choice on, hey, choose two more that you're going to look at as you are exploring this. Um, through ISME, we do some work in North Carolina with North Carolina's Go Open movement called Go Open and See, and they actually took that rubric and made some modifications to make it specific to the local context. And so they have their own North Carolina quality review rubric, which is also linked there. And we find that teachers, um, not only do they find more high quality resources, but they remix them in a more high quality way. And when they create their own materials, they create them in a more high quality way as well. Um, that little asterisk is there next to your team because we know that right now um, your team might look very different than it has in the past. So on the next slide, um, we just really have found that when you are remixing your materials, so whether you're a classroom teacher and right now you're like, whoa, this is not how I can teach biology anymore, right? I can't do the same labs that I used to do. I can't do the same classroom activities. We really have found that when you're working online and you're working with OER, there are these really amazing opportunities to work with other specialists that maybe you haven't thought about working with before. For, and they might be a little bit more accessible right now because everyone is doing that online engagement. Um, so your school library media specialist, your English learner specialist, your EC, exceptional children, technology facilitators. When we work with teachers around OER, we really encourage them not to think of it as asking for help, but asking for that collaboration. Uh, there's a really great project that lives on OER Commons. Uh, it's called School Librarians Advancing STEM Learning. And uh, so we really see this time of remote continuous learning as this opportunity to say, I really can choose a few small things and really make them a good fit for this virtual learning. Because um, as Christina mentioned, there's the possibility that in the fall, your teaching context will look super different. So um, how do you start to edit and remix things now? A, making sure that what you have gives you permission to edit and remix, but then choosing those things and when you edit and remix them, um, invite these other specialists to participate with you because um, what will come out of it is, is really exciting. Um, on the next slide, we also just really encourage you to think as you create new materials, which I'm such a big fan of the asterisk, uh, hopefully you aren't creating a lot of brand new materials. Hopefully you aren't going out and searching from scratch. Um, but as you do create or produce remixes, um, 
we do really encourage educators to um, purposefully collaborate in teams to divide and conquer. Um, it can be hard to kind of, as Dan was talking about, relinquish a little bit of that. Well, this is how I've always taught it and I know how to do this, but we see a lot of value in saying, hey, I'm going to take on this lesson if you take on that one and we will truly collaborate around it. We do want to encourage our educators, as always, those copyright terms of images and videos. It used to be when I started teaching for North Carolina Virtual Public Schools eight years ago, it was really hard to find openly licensed images of a mitochondria, but it's not hard anymore. So while you might have the same picture of mitochondria that you've been using for the past 10 years, it will be really easy to find a new image and give that conspicuous attribution, right? Not down in the um, notes of the PowerPoint, but right there on the PowerPoint slide. But then also make sure that you're finding a platform to share openly. North Carolina's initiative is called Go Open, and one of the really cool things about it is if I found something that Jana Tollison made that I like, I can actually find her as a user, follow her, follow the things that she likes, the things that she says, the things that she makes. Um, so as you're sharing things, maybe you're sharing them on Twitter or Facebook or internal to your district, but consider sharing them openly on a platform like um, OER Commons or some of the other platforms. And then the last piece just is on the next slide. Um, as you implement your resources. Um, just one thing from being a virtual teacher that I found is organization is actually way, way more important than it is. <laughs> as much as it's important in a classroom, it's even more important in a remote learning virtual classroom because giving those consistent naming patterns so that you can have an order of assignments, your students and their families can, and it seems like a really small thing to think about when you're implementing remote learning and virtual learning learning, but that nomenclature is a huge payoff as well as for helping people find what they're looking for. And just the last thing that I want to say is regarding this collaboration piece, um, I love when I can give feedback as others are using it. So when I implement a resource, I love being able to say, um, this was what I really loved about the resource. This is what I would change about it. Um, so would really encourage folks to consider making sure that you're using a platform that lets you leave feedback for as you use it or for others. Thanks, Joanna. Um, and we're going to pause here. I have a question, couple of questions for you. Talk a little bit about what we've just gone over and then switch to talking about some sources and materials. One thing um, we hear is a lot of different practices, finding materials, vetting materials, implementing them are all sort of condensed down into this big curation idea. And you talked briefly about how that's not just teachers. We often use teachers sort of as a shorthand but it's a bigger group that can include librarians and technology specialists and others. I know librarians in particular are often a real partner in this. Can you talk a little bit about bringing librarians into those collaborations? Sure, if you don't mind going back two slides, I think it was. Um, all of those um, specialists are super helpful for curation because they bring a different lens, right? So when you talk about curating, one of the most important things to do is make sure you don't have tunnel vision, that you're not just going to the same resources you've always used. Uh, right now, North Carolina is getting ready to have an academy where they work on curating resources that are related to culturally relevant teaching. And that's where we want this huge set of different educators who can say, well, there isn't one best way to find a resource that is best practices of culturally relevant teaching because it's in respect to your students, it's in respect to the educator. And so, yes, librarians are a huge source of support because they have um, this much broader view of where do I find resources and how do I find the ones I'm really looking for rather than that keyword Google search that we're used to doing as educators. Um, but including all of those others really helps you bring in multiple lenses that as a classroom educator focused on content standards like <laughs> the structure of mitochondria, I often miss those other pieces. Thanks. Um, and so we're going to turn now to the next section of the um, webinar and talk a little bit about platforms to find OER and um, resources there. 
But um, the other thing I'm just going to take sort of moderator privilege to add is a lot of the talk here is about um, finding open resources to include and doing that sort of copyright evaluation. But it's important to think that open resources are one very important part of that. But fair use can also allow you to import third party materials for uh, illustration, for quotation, for those teaching purposes. But I think just as Joanna and Molly were saying, you do need to think that through. So fair use is really powerful for teachers, but if you are gonna rely on fair use, your rationale needs to be something stronger than, I found this on Google and it was the right color, but certainly, you know, if there's a reason that, for example, the picture of the mitochondria you had, Joanna, was exactly the right one, and you were using it and you were really digging into it and talking about that part, you might be able to rely on that if there's not, if there's a reason, like a fair use rationale for that, but you would need to um, have done that fair use analysis. So whether you're relying on open licensing or relying on fair use, um, in that situation, you'd want to document the open licensing information or your fair use analysis. For a deeper dive on using fair use to create and adapt OER, join us next week. Next week's webinar is going to be on um, creating and adapting OER, but that's sort of getting ahead of ourselves. Right now, we're going to hear from uh, Melinda Boland, who is a manager of OER projects and services at the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management in Education, that is me. And there it is me, Melinda manages a team of project managers, information management professionals, and designers. Mindy, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, this has been really, really great to hear everyone's um, different presentations and how they're all just all talking about so much about collaboration, which is just a key part of open educational practice. Um, I wanted to start with just an introduction to ISKME as an organization. I think a lot of people are familiar with OER Commons, our digital library, but um, ISKME stands for the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management in Education, as Meredith said, and um, OER Commons is our flagship digital library and collaboration platform. It's been around for about 13 years and um, over that period, we've really been able to develop a strong digital learning infrastructure that has become critical for a moment like now when we're looking at all of these educators shifting to remote teaching and learning. Um, we have partners around the United States in K-12 and in higher education and also around the globe working with UNESCO and other um, international organizations. And we also as a nonprofit are always seeking to further our mission of equitable access to education. So that includes um, providing the tools that make it easy for folks to get the resources where they need them, for example, in their learning management system, through Google Classroom, or directly onto a site, making sure they're always available, they're openly licensed, and then um, can be curated to the needs of, um, of the teachers in the different contexts. Um, if we go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about how you can use OER Commons to search for resources that you can use now um, <laughs> or whenever. Um, so it is a digital library and a collaboration platform. So one of the things um, about OER Commons that it was built from the ground up to support open education. So really, we have a lot of workflows in there to help teachers collaborate with one another and um, once they've done that, they can begin searching and sharing resources um, in groups and across the site. So if you're using OER Commons to find resources you can use, uh, there are several methods that you can take. We have a search bar right on the home screen where you can use keywords, you can filter by subjects, by grade levels. You can also drill down by academic standards if you're looking for something that's been aligned to Common Core. Um, once you've conducted your search, there's a, there are a number of filters on the left that you can use to further refine your search results. Uh, for example, you can filter again by standards, but also by material type. So I know that um, sometimes we think of OER and people are thinking, oh, I need to replace the entire year's worth of curriculum. And that, especially right now, where we're kind of getting to the end of a semester, you may just be looking for things day to day that you can use and that you can sequence together for a lesson plan in a given day. 
So using that material type filter allows you to say, I'm looking for a lab or I'm looking for just a, some short piece of content. It really helps you um, refine your search based on the level of granularity you're looking for or the approach you're looking for in a resource. So I encourage folks to do that kind of search refinement when they get that, that result that has like 1400 resources. It really will make it less overwhelming if you do that. Um, I've also included a link here to advanced search on OER Commons. Often that is used by our librarians who have the skills to kind of set their search parameters at the outset. But um, it's a pretty easy and in intuitive tool for uh, search and discovery. We use, spend a lot of time generating metadata around our resources to make them easier to find. Um, if we go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about how, oh, there you go. <laughs> Um, about how you can actually use OER Commons to benefit from the work of others. So I think we've talked about not recreating the wheel here a number of times. Um, on OER Commons, we have what we call network hubs, and those are pages of the site. We can think of them almost as wings in the library where an organization has um, maybe provided curated resources, collections of resources, um, where they have validated them to uh, share with among their own cohort. So for example, if you go to the hubs page, you can see the work that's been done in the state of Nebraska, where they've created curated collections of OER. And you can, you can um, rest assured that they have been validating those resources if you want to find something that has already been vetted. Um, I think looking at the work of others on things like the hubs or in groups, um, also just browsing really provides you with a nice starting point um, when you're looking for OER. So there are a lot of different ways to browse. I've included those here on this slide. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention is um, on the next slide is a, a hub that we put together at ISKME specifically for this moment because we found, you know, <laughs> we have so many materials and people are so overwhelmed. So we've decided to put together this hub called K-12 Remote Learning. We had a number of um, partners and users come to us asking for resources that are student facing. So we have a lot of lesson plans and things like that, but you can't just really assign those to your students. So the collections on this hub are meant to be student facing. They've been curated by grade band. So you can see even here the elementary, middle school, high school. Um, those are all different collections. They're organized by subjects. And then we also have a number of provider collections, which I think we'll be looking at a little more um, or talking about those different providers a little bit more here today. We have collections from CK12, from code.org, Khan Academy, all of those wonderful content providers. We've aggregated them on OER Commons to make them easy to find. And you can use the K12 Remote Learning Hub as a starting point, or you can also look at the provider page on OER Commons. Um, one thing that I just wanted to share in, in all of this has been um, we've talked to a lot of our partners who have hubs on OER Commons or who have um, OER Commons microsites like the one that Joanna was speaking about with North Carolina. And um, one of our partners in Pennsylvania recently said to us that they felt like they had done so much work developing their hub on OER Commons that they were ready for this moment, that they had really created the laid the groundwork. Um, with their hub to be ready to support teachers shifting to remote learning. And of course, that for us, that was wonderful to hear and super heartening. For you all, I say go look at the PAIU hub and see what they've done because they feel ready for this moment. And uh, you can probably learn a lot from the work that they've done in curating content and making it available to their educators. I mean, they've done extensive professional learning around the state, but it's a wonderful model for sharing with others. Um, so, yeah, that's about it for OER Commons. We are always thinking about things like accessibility and being able to share and making sure this is available for all. So I encourage you to go and browse and find some resources that you can use in your classrooms today. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for joining us, Cindy. And mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point that if you are in a district that is just starting out, um, you don't, you know, we've heard a lot about these really amazing finding and curation processes, but you're not going to be able to do that. You can do parts of that, but you can't do that whole thing between now and when you start teaching again in August or September. And so as Mindy said, finding districts and schools that have already done that and are publicly sharing 
what they're doing, one of the sort of core parts of OER is that people can reshare and want to reshare. And so you can take things sort of already intact and just use them. Um, and then Christina is going to talk a lot about some of the publisher type organizations that have resources that are more out of the box ready to go that you can either adopt wholesale or do sort of less curation than you might if you're trying to build something up from individual resources. So on the next slide, Christina will start uh, with Open Up Resources. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, of course. So uh, this is by no means definitive or exhaustive. I always have to preface, just like Meredith has to say, I'm not um, giving you legal advice. Uh, so <laughs> um, after leaving the Department of Ed, I, I reached out to a lot of districts and I was like, what resources are you using? And so we've been able to kind of compile a curated list at New America and we've really just kind of categorized them. And this was a quick change in, in the midst of everything that we're in right now. We had it all kind of keyworded by, you know, uh, learning objects and openly licensed curriculum and all of this and we're like let's stop that and go back to comprehensive or supplemental and so that's how we're kind of looking at these and so again by no means exhaustive because we know that there are plenty of other resources out there that exist um, and what Mindy just brought up with OER Commons being an incredible resource um, that has been around for well over 10 years um, so there are a number of resources available but let's look at some comprehensive uh, resources that might help you kind of off the shelf like Meredith mentioned. So Open Up Resources started as the K-12 Open Up or Open Collaborative and this is between 12 different uh, states that decided they needed math curriculum that would be pretty cohesive and that they could all share. It um, changed a little bit and then became what it is right now. So Open Up Resources have three different offerings. They are a K-5 English language arts series called Bookworms, which functions pretty similarly to most English language arts series that you have um, from publishers. Then you have the EL Education Alternative, which is more um, expeditionary learning is what it's called. And there's actually, you can go through them as well, but it's more inquiry based. And so it's not quite as teacher heavy. And so it's important to know that those two offerings uh, vary in what they actually have. And then they also have 6-8 Math, which is through their partner, Illustrative Mathematics. Um, they provide the content for free, and then you can purchase printing and professional learning if that is what you choose to do. They've also had um, quite a bit of their content reviewed by Ed Reports. And if you are not familiar with Ed Reports, when we were talking about the, the, the quality of things, this is a third party provider Ed reports that reviews uh, a majority of series that we have in math, English language arts, and now they've included science. And so you can go on to edreports.org and see if the content or the series that you have in your schools are actually reviewed on there. Um, and then they have three different things that they focus on. Uh, if we go next, then we have EL education. As I just mentioned, this is more, uh, called expeditionary learning and so this is much more inquiry based uh, this is a k-5 series and you may see some similarity between this and engage new york which is really this the first state that got involved with oer in 2012 when they took their race to the top funding from the u.s department of education and put a call out for openly licensed content and so they have a full um k it's actually pre-K-12 math and English language arts and so they worked with Yale education on this so they are another one that provide the content for free and then for a small fee then you could pay for professional learning and printing this is also reviewed by ed reports the next one is da -da -da -da, there we go illustrative mathematics <laughs> so uh, this is a comprehensive series they started in 6-8 math they've now expanded to 9-12 math that they'll be implementing this coming school year in 2020-21 and they're also doing some pilot testing right now for a K-5 math series. So uh, really robust as far as the series itself. They provide the content for free and have several partners that will help them with the professional learning and any sort of printing or um, digital access. This is reviewed by Ed Reports. Uh, it is it's done really well. It's great to see that this has continued to grow um, in usage across the country uh, for comprehensive series, as well as the depth that it goes into for teaching math. Um, and it, again, what Dan had said about looking at instructional practices, it really kind of changes the way that we teach math. So that's been really helpful um, to also see. Next, we have OpenStax. Um, OpenStax is actually really well known in higher education. 
They do a lot of content in openly licensed uh, 100 and 200 level courses, but then they have a lot of content that could also be brought down. When we talk about revising and remixing, um, they their top five um, books are actually used in high schools, which are, I'm going to forget which ones they are. They're science-based, so it's biology and chemistry and, and like the 101 courses that you would, yeah. And then those are being used in a lot of high school classes. They also were, um, they received funding from the Texas Education Agency, the Department of Ed in Texas, to develop five AP textbooks. And these are college board approved. So this is really important for people that are looking for AP materials, that it's college board approved. And so these are macro, micro, economics. Um, I'm going to forget all of the other ones too, but there are five of them, I promise. <laughs> Um, and they have the digital and analog offerings, which I think is really important. So it is a textbook, but then folks that are part of the OpenStax community develop all the ancillary and supplemental materials, including slide decks and quizzes and tests and all of those kind of pieces. And so that is um, certainly part of the OpenStax offerings. And they also hired a K-12 director, Andrew Yanakakis, um, who's been working directly with K-12 teachers and getting feedback from them to make sure that they are addressing the needs in the K-12 community. Um, a quick plug, if you're interested to know more, I have an OER podcast with him just this week, uh, Revise, Remix, Redesign, where we actually talk about this. So uh, if you're interested to learn more, please check that out. Next, we have CK-12, which Dan had uh, mentioned in some of the work that they use for that core content in Grossmont. The comprehensive series that they offer is K-12 science, and this is new because it used to be more middle school and high school, and now they've gone all the way down to kindergarten, which is really exciting to see. They also have first through 12th grade math, as well as nine through 12 social sciences. They're flex books, so similar to an OpenStax, it's an openly licensed textbook. But what I love and sets them apart a little bit more is CK-12. They were known for their openly licensed books, the flex books, but then they had built all these additional simulations and interactions and they were separate for a long time and now with the new Flexbooks 2.0 they've integrated those and so you have the the textbook but then the interactives and the simulations are actually built into the page um, have no fear if you are not a one-to-one -one district or your students don't have device access you can still print these so that's important to know is that they are available via um, digital and analog access next we look at not a comprehensive series but more of a supplemental uh, series and that is the Khan Academy. Khan Academy has been around for a number of years. I remember when I was still teaching, um, and even when we talk about this at the state level in Nebraska, we knew that the offerings that, that Khan Academy had was um, quite robust, and they've continued to add to it. So they have quite a bit of STEM material, as well as computer science, um, social sciences. They have some test prep stuff in there. And they've also created, like, alignment with Engage New York, which again is that OER content. Um, so they have all of these things kind of scoped and sequenced that you could certainly supplement what you have. Um, I would not call it a comprehensive series uh, because I wouldn't just simply send my kids to it, but I would supplement because it is high quality content and I, I do believe that it certainly helps teach certain um, skills and standards. Next, we have Match Fish Tank, which is a newer one. Uh, this is based out of the Match Charter School System in Boston. And this is a comprehensive series that they have first through fifth grade science and social sciences, third through 12th grade math, and K-12 English language arts. Ed Reports recently reviewed um, sections of their math and their um, English language arts. They came back really strong. Um, the, the piece that I love the most, and Joanna mentioned, is the culturally relevant piece. So unlike a lot of the English language arts series that are out there that still have the canon of uh, very traditional kind of authors and particularly white authors, I feel like they've done a really great job on the culturally relevant piece and um, have made sure to include authors of color as well as made sure that the instructional materials are actually inclusive and representative of their students. Um, and so then that's applicable and usable by anyone else. We have three more which uh, again, going back to the supplemental and, and comprehensive, we have Open Syed next. And Open Syed is, they're starting, their goal is comprehensive, but they're starting with units right now. And so they are doing 6-8 science, again, aligned to next gen science standards. So much deeper as far as when they go into science and they have um, students being scientists instead of just reading about it. But they have specific units that they're rolling out right now. 
some that are already in classrooms and have done really well. And then they just have this really incredible supportive kind of professional learning community and teacher cohort. They, um, they've been providing all sorts of resources right now for the switch to remote learning and saying, okay, so if you can't be in a lab, here's what you could do and trying to provide as many alternatives as possible. So that's, um, they continue to roll out some really great things and I'm excited to see um, more content come from them. Next we have Zern and Zern Math is a K-5 math series that was all teacher created, uh, largely used digitally. Uh, you can certainly print them, but digital resources and I know some districts that are using kind of a combination of maybe a Eureka math um, that is partnered with Zern. So they have a, you know, like a print version and then they have kids do the online Zern components. And so those two play well together, but they also can just be used alone. And Zern is another one that is Ed Reports reviewed and has done really well as far as K-5 math instruction. And finally, we have Common Lit. Uh, Common Lit is technically supplemental right now. Um, they have fifth through eighth grade English language arts. And I would actually say fifth through 12th grade. I might've done that as a, as a typo. So fifth through 12th grade, my apologies. English language arts and literacy offerings. I am currently helping write curriculum with a school district in Colorado for English language arts. And we're using common lit a lot. And the reason we're doing that is because we're approaching this kind of inquiry based where we've asked essential questions for each quarter, sixth through 12th grade. And then we have selected a number of texts for our novel sets and things like that. But then we have all these additional texts that we're going to put in there and that's largely through Common Lit. So they have them organized by grade level, by themes, genre, novels. And then what I love the most is the text sets. So if we do have specific texts that we want students to be able to use, um, again, thinking of your traditional canon or thinking outside and more common um, or more updated young adult novels, they have a lot of complementary kind of sets that can be used with that. And those are all nonfiction pieces. Um, so they, they come from NPR, they come from CNN, they come from different news sources that I really enjoy the nonfiction kind of comprehensive or, uh, piece that's with that complementary piece. They are working on a comprehensive curriculum right now that will be for middle school English language arts. So um, I was with one of their um, folks a couple months ago, seems like a really long time ago, and um, that is something that is in the works right now. So more info to come on that. That was a really, really fast rundown of all yeah. of those. <laughs> that was, yeah, you know, 20 or 30,000 pages worth of educational materials in 11 minutes. So like, <laughs> good job. Um, and so these are really just meant to be a place where if you're looking for stuff to adopt for the fall, these are good starting places to look for that. You know, it's really just the sort of tip of what's available. There's a huge amount of teacher and district created material in other places, but this is a good place to start for the biggest pieces that are sort of off the shelf adoptable. Um, Christina, so if we've convinced people that OER might yes. be part of their solution <laughs> for the fall and for their teaching going forward. So what next? What next? Uh, several things. I think it's important to find people and find community members and collaborators or co-conspirators, whatever you want to call them, uh, at the school level as well as the district level or just kind of within your uh, kind of area. If I think about San Diego County, there are 43 school districts in San Diego County where, um, where Dan is. And he's right next door to San Diego Unified, which is the second largest district in all of California. So it's 130,000 students, whereas they've got like 16,000 students. So there are opportunities for us to collaborate across districts and across kind of counties and, and even within the state. So I think that there is an opportunity here for us to find the people that are interested in doing this. Um, I would also suggest getting involved in content specific organizations. So we are all you know within our specific kind of content areas whether that is science math english language arts social studies social sciences whatever it may be there are national organizations that exist for each of those content areas um, world languages not to be excluded arts music all of them um, so let's have those conversations around oer because we know that most ninth grade teachers are teaching x and y and so let's not reinvent the wheel um, i know that ncte for english and english language arts they have Read, Write, Think, which is a collaboration between them and the International Literacy Association. We are actually in conversation with them right now on clarifying kind of their terms of use. 
and they want it all to be open, which is really exciting. Um, so we want more of that to happen. I know that NCTM has also had that conversation in the Mac world, so that's exciting to see. Uh, lastly, I would say advocate at the state and federal level. Um, it, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's really important to get involved with this right now because there is money and, well, there will be money through the CARES Act uh, where this will be considered as far as the instructional materials piece. And so it's really important that educators, you may not think that your voice will be heard, but it's so critical that you, whether you're making phone calls, sending emails, or sending letters um, to your, your state education agencies, to your boards of education on how they may approach this, it's really important to advocate for this. Uh, we will continue to do that at the federal level. <laughs> But at the state level, it's really important. And then they can think about how they want to use that, that federal funding for sure. Thank you, Christina. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll go to the last slide now. Um, I don't see any other questions. If you have one, um, now's the time to drop it in. But I would just say, um, you know, today we've seen sort of the first piece about how to find OER. Next week, we're going to take a deeper dive on creating OER, either creating it from scratch or doing a really sort of larger scale adaptation and remix. So we'll talk about um, the process for doing that. We'll talk about how fair use can enable you to bring in third party materials like illustrations or quotations or excerpts. We'll also talk about the funding for that. So how for many districts when you're facing a funding crunch right now or a funding crunch this fall, money that has been traditionally spent on purchasing textbooks can be repurpose to pay teachers on special assignment. So even though you have a lower overall budget, more of it is staying in the school and paying teachers and not just going out to publishers. So all of that will be um, covered next Friday in our creating and adapting OER webinar. Um, the uh, recording for this webinar will also be up at that link as will the slides and a, a link to request a certificate of attendance. Um, there's, uh, some, uh, there's some information that's been shared in the chat uh, about some full course math and ELA that wasn't in the original set of slides. I'm going to um, answer that in the chat, but we'll also update the slides with that as well. It's from um, Barbara Suits, who is a champion of OER <laughs> out in Washington, um, and who doesn't know it yet, but I am going to email to ask to be on next week's webinar. So hopefully we can then. Um, and thank you all for joining us. If any of the other panelists have um, anything they'd like to add before we say goodbye, now's your moment. But thanks again, everyone, for joining us and for the, um, the time that you took to be with us. Thanks all, and thanks again. Um, I'm, I'll tell see you next week. Bye. Great.